Hey everyone, Ryan here with Blake's Eye Studios. Welcome back to Heavy Reflection. Today's topic of discussion is yet another one I've been thinking about for a long time, but some recent events has, has made this really relevant in the news with some things going on in uh, electric guitars specifically. And so I thought now would be a, a good time to kind of give my opinion on the matter and, and, and talk about how this is affecting the industry as a whole. So the larger part of this argument I want to make is that guitar gear, and especially electric guitars, have almost reached this point to where they're kind of commodities. When I say that word commodity, I don't necessarily mean like agricultural products or fossil fuels, as you might think of that word sometimes. I'll be using the word commodity in the sense that all the stuff we're talking about is really widespread. It's very available. There's so many competitors that things like brand name and the manufacturing, it doesn't really matter much anymore. Obviously there's features that differentiate one product from another. You see that in any industry that deals with kind of commodity items. But for the most part, a lot of these things are so boilerplate, they're so standard, they're so integral to the concept of an electric guitar or an overdrive pedal or an amplifier that you can't give the credit to one entity, whether we're talking about an individual or a company. So that brings us to the focal point of today's conversation. That is, of course, Gibson's lawsuit against Dean and Luna Guitars. And this is one that, oh man, when I saw that video that <laughs> that uh, was a precursor to all of this, I, I just I had a feeling this was coming. But this is just one of the perfect examples of, you know, you, you've got an industry leader and at this point, a former leader who's, you know, it, it's pot calling the, the kettle black. Out of all the things that I truly despise in this world, hypocrisy might just be my top pick. And this, this case is drenched in hypocrisy. Of course, when we're talking about legal matters, that doesn't really have any bearing. It's all about case law. It's all about precedent. More specifically, it's about how much leverage, how much muscle you have behind your legal department, and well, Gibson's got a hefty one, so it would not surprise me in the least to see them succeed in some way. But there are at least a few legal precedents um, and, and more common sense that I think will be working against them here. So I want to touch on a little bit of that. Now, I'm by no means a legal expert. I'm not going to sit here and pretend to be some legal authority, some armchair lawyer, because I'm not. I'll tell you merely what I know of the situation and kind of how it relates to things that I've experienced in the private sector and how I, I could foresee Gibson and other large manufacturers of instruments kind of navigating those things. Um, so with that, I suppose, what what's happened for those of you that have been living under a rock? I'm sure most of you have heard this by now, but Gibson Guitars has issued some cease and desist as well as some lawsuits towards Dean Guitars and Luna. Um, owned by kind of the same company. And their argument is that classic, oh, you're infringing on our uh, copyrighted material. People are going to think um, that, you know, your guitars are the same as ours. It's the one big counterfeit argument. And they've done this for a while successfully. So back in the late 70s and early 80s, known as the lawsuit era, Ibanez and other Japanese manufacturers were making guitars that, for all intents and purposes, were straight up copies of Gibson's stuff. There was really no way around it. And for an uneducated, you know, uninformed customer at that time, I could see how they could play that argument. I could see where they say, look, there is zero difference between this and this other than, you know, this was made somewhere else. Some of them actually have Gibson written on them, uh, not necessarily from those companies, but there are still guitars being made today that are legitimate, you know, counterfeits. Um, and that is a legitimate problem. And so they had some leverage there. Uh, you might have noticed I'm actually holding an Electra. I think this is a 2247, if I remember correctly. Uh, they call it the Tree of Life. But it looks like an SG. It's basically an SG. It has everything down to the Gibson headstock shape. And uh, the only difference is it says Electra, other than, you know, they've got a volute and actually better construction than they did and honestly continue to still have <laughs> and it's a great guitar. Um, some cheaper, you know, components on it, but that's that's what you were going to get back in the day for paying these sort of prices. But Gibson successfully defended their guitar body shapes and their headstock shapes to the point that manufacturers like Ibanez had to change pretty much their entire lineup. You know, the Destroyer, which used to be a complete Explorer copy, looks quite a bit different now. Um, any Vs they make are, are quite a bit uh, different in shape. There's no real perfect Les Paul copy out of them anymore. 
So, you know, there is precedent for them to defend their brand, so to speak. However, with, with Dean, this is a weird one because Dean's been doing this for a while. Number one, uh, they did fall out of business for a while before being revived and, and bought out by uh, other parent companies. But, I mean, they've been making these guitars for, you know, 25 years straight, something like that, if not longer. Uh, and there hasn't been really any problems with that up until then. They've always made Vs. Hell, they they make Explorers that look exactly like Gibson Explorers, minus the um, scale length and everything, but the bodies look identical. you got models like the Cadillac with this Explorer-type horn and a rounder Les Paul-type body on the bottom half, and all these guitars have sort of a dual humbucker to pneumatic bridge setup but there are larger differences at play as well. It's so not only scale length, but the headstock looks, well, pretty much absolutely nothing like Gibson's. Um, I've seen them in a, a couple of their figures trying to compare it to a backwards flying V headstock. It, it just doesn't work. It's, you know, not only inverse, there's a big V chunk out of it um, between that and the branding. No one in the year 2019 or going forward is going to confuse a Dean headstock with a Gibson headstock. It's just not going to happen. So for them to be playing this angle, to, to try to highlight Dean guitars as some kind of counterfeit to Gibson is just embarrassing at this point. It, it really is. Of course, if they can weasel their way through a legal precedent, they're going to try it. But let's talk about some of the reasons why I think that is just a horrifically bad argument. First of all, the headstock shape. Um, I think a lot of manufacturers are hell bent on protecting their headstock shape because that's about all they have. And there's precedent for this as well. So back in, I think 2009, Fender tried to sue the pants off of about everyone who was making a Stratocaster or Telecaster shape. I, I think Warmoth was a part of that. Um, ESP, LTD, probably a couple others. Maybe I'm misremembering even those, but now there were some pretty high profile characters in there. And they were saying basically what Gibson is trying to say, at least I think Fender had a, a bit better argument um, where Dean Guitars has some, some variation. There are some things where you look at and go, oh, that's not a Gibson. Uh, but you look at some of these Stratocaster clones or Telecaster clones, and I use that word very deliberately, clones, and you're like, yeah, from here down, if you don't look at the headstock, you could think that's a fender. They lost that case, though, because the courts ruled that, you know, you've been sitting on ass for 50 years, basically. You've had these shapes, and you've let all these small brands take it, and you've done nothing about it. So there, what's happened is, number one, the shape of the electric guitar, the Stratocaster, is now so ubiquitous, it's so generic that you cannot possibly say this is a Fender thing anymore. Even if you did invent it, you basically let this be open source without protecting your brand. And that's one of the major problems when it comes to legalities. If you're not actively seeking out to protect your patents or your copyrights, then you know people can do whatever the hell they want with it. And the same thing fell with the Telecaster. So they basically said, eat dirt because you didn't do anything about it till now and you're just looking for money. And I'm pretty sure that's what Gibson is doing right here as well. So even if Dean was making a perfect SG copy or a perfect Explorer copy or Flying V copy, and plenty of smaller brands do, keep that in mind, then they still wouldn't have much of a precedent to say, oh, well, people are going to think that's our guitars. Yeah, I can give you a little sympathy there, but the thing that has really saved a lot of small luthiers' ass is the headstock shape. And even Fender went after a few people that you know, had a closer shape um, than they had desired. And I think they've won a few of those. But as you'll notice, whether we're talking, you know, agile guitars from Rondo Music, um, Legator, any number of small luthiers, pretty much all their headstock shapes are, are somewhat original. Obviously, there's only so many ways you can put six to eight tuning, you know, pegs on, uh, on a piece of wood. If they're in line, if they're, you know, not quite as ridiculously spaced out like this, they're going to look somewhat similar but you know whether it be the crown on the top something decorative you can do a little bit with it and so i think for gibson to be coming at this from a headstock point of view as well is just stupid because it dean's does not look anything like theirs the closest example dean has lies on their single and double cut guitars but even then that headstock looks closer to something like a prs so if anyone should be mad over that it, it shouldn't be gibson 
So they are really grasping for straws, I feel, playing that angle. So that's a bad enough look already, but let's take a bit of a deeper dive into some of Gibson's history and, and point out some more things that are wrong with this argument. So first of all, their headstock. They want to be super protective over this, like, like a lot of um, aspects of their guitar design, which is understandable to a point. The problem is they parade stuff like this and even other brands they've acquired, like Epiphone, as if they invented the freaking electric guitar, as if this was entirely their idea, their awful headstock design that tends to snap off. One of them has done it to me. Um, this particular little crown thing has been seen on like medieval mandolins and lutes and that kind of stuff from the 15th and 16th century. So Gibson, you are doing exactly what other brands are doing by borrowing your designs and you're not crediting anyone for it. It's almost like this is such a basic concept that it shouldn't be legally protected, but hey, what do I know? For another example, take a look at the Dreadnought acoustic guitar shape. Back in the early 1900s, pre-World War II era, Martin was kind of the, the first company to popularize that shape, bring it to mass market. And it wasn't but within a couple years that Gibson had their own. Now, by their logic today, that's stealing. Or maybe it's just so simple, maybe it's just so commonplace that someone should just be able to borrow that design. I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that. Problem is, that's pretty much exactly what Gibson is suing Luna Guitars over. So which is it, Gibson? You can't have your cake and eat it too unless that their entire position is, well, we were here first, we set the legal precedent. And, you know, that might win, but it's a pretty douchey thing to do. Perhaps the most ignorantly unaware statement that they made in that video that was inevitably ripped apart by the community was something along the lines of, well, you know, Gibson's a brand, and a brand is more than just a name. Is it Gibson? Is it now? Uh, coming from the same company that will throw their logo, their name, on just about anything from hats to stools to stickers, coffee mugs, shot glasses, t-shirts. Uh, let's see. Oh, look at here. It's a Les Paul studio reference monitor that costs about twice as much than it should just because it has a, some bastardized version of, a, of an electric guitar on the faceplate. So is it more than a brand name? Because I don't really think it is. Uh, I'll show you one good example of that. What I'm holding in my hands right now is a Wolf S85 bass. This is something that I would never expect to see hanging up new in your local guitar center, but it's a damn fine instrument for the relatively affordable price that it is. It, it plays great, sounds pretty damn good. It could stand some upgrades here and there, but all instruments in this price range could. Uh, it's really well put together, and I use it to record about everything. And what's interesting with this is it comes from the same factory that a lot of LTD guitars do in South Korea. So what's the biggest difference between this? Well, you know, it's neck through construction, a little bit different body shape, a little bit different headstocks, a lot of the same kind of hardware you'd see. I've got some proprietary, you know, preamps and um, you know, pickups and all that kind of stuff that you might expect. But at the end of the day, the construction, the processes, the quality, it's going through the same lines. It's probably going through very similar specs. So I would attest this is the biggest difference. And Gibson does the same thing with their Epiphone guitars that are made overseas. So is a brand more than a name? Well, these days, barring a few exceptions, I would say not really. I, that's really what it boils down to. So with all those examples in mind, with all these things actively working against Gibson's case, why the hell would they do this now? Why would they let a competitor, and not even that big of a competitor in the grand scheme of things, do what they do for literally decades and then they try to attack them? In my opinion, it's pure desperation because that's what it looks like. Um, as a lot of you know, Gibson's had some bankruptcy trouble in the last few years, and a lot of that was due to some of those things I was showing you, try to branching out into lifestyle and, and things they have no business in. How about this? Try to make quality electric guitars, try to make things that consumers want, and maybe they'll buy that. Um, but instead, they've had to reorganize. They've undoubtedly got new management, and that new management is probably saying, we need X amount of revenue. And marketing and accounting saying, well, that's impossible because we're just not getting units out the door. We're still having quality control issues in, in these regards. And, um, you know, we've reissued reissues and 
Uh, only so many people are going to buy new guitars like this. And so what's you know another quick way to make a buck is to you know litigate someone. And that's pretty much what I think is going on. And even if that's not the whole story, I'm sure that's part of it. And nonetheless, it's not a good look. It's not a good look, Gibson, no matter what way you spin it. You've already had all these things on top of you, which were not good, um, trying to innovate in ways that the old players didn't want. And then going back to your roots that the new players weren't necessarily impressed with. Me personally, if I want to buy a vintage type Gibson guitar, I'm just going to buy an old Gibson. I don't know why they keep trying to re-release the same shit every time. Um, it's, you know, fine to a certain extent. If it does the job, cool. But, you know, your baby boomer market at some point is going to dry out and the new guitar players aren't all that on board. And again, if I do want to play that kind of vintage style thing, I'll go buy something from the 70s like this is from. On the flip side, you take a look at the Boss Roland Corporation who have been absolutely killing it with products over the past few years. You got the 500 series, this is the MD 500, it's got the modulation stuff, uh, they got delay and reverb, they've come out with a slightly pared down 200 series here recently. You've got um, their GT processors which keep getting better, they're not quite Axe FX level but um, definitely a lot of great strides there. They're still making their classic stomp boxes, which have sold you know enough units that every guitar player on earth can own a couple and you won't run out. And even then they're bringing back reissues of the stuff people are actually asking for, like the Dimension. And I hope we see a metal zone, or not a metal zone, a heavy metal at some point. We already have the metal zone because people ask for it. Amazing, it's what happens when you listen. But all these things are a great balance of, you know, keeping the vintage stuff happy while coming up with cool new features like digital effects and MIDI capability and, um, you know, nice interfaces and all this stuff. So Gibson could definitely stand to take a page or two out of Boss's playbook because when it comes to affordable effects or even just really high value effects like that, they're going to rule the world at some point if uh, no one catches up to them. And this is another really interesting example because they're very comparable to Gibson in that there's a lot of imitators. You've got companies like Behringer who are making pedals with what I assume is pennies of profit margin because I don't know how you make a stomp box for $30, even if it's made out of plastic and you make tens of thousands of them. But you've got stuff like a Boss GE7, which has been more or less copied slider for slider function for function by Behringer that they're selling for less than half of the cost of this, but Boss isn't suing them into the ground. It's partially because they make everyone's stuff. Um, if you, you look into what that business does, they, they actually make a lot of the components that even boutique pedal manufacturers make. But, you know, Behringer has literal clones of other people's stuff, and they're really not shy about hiding that fact. But instead of trying to actively silence every whisper of competition out there, Boss just does what Boss does well and makes good stuff and tries to stand out from those things, even though they are very similar. And so in a big roundabout way, all this comes back to my original point. I think a lot of guitars, guitar gear in general, is a commodity. It's so freaking similar. It is so non-genius at this point, because that's a lot of what you know, comes down with copyright and patent law in general is that it has to be something that no every man can come up with. But, you know, it doesn't take a genius to think, well, put a neck on a slab of wood and put some strings across it anymore to make a quality one, make a good one, absolutely. But, you know, in the same way you don't have, say, kosher pickles suing every other pickle company, it, it doesn't take a genius to make a pickle anymore. Um, all these companies are going to have things to try to, to stand out. But at the end of the day, whether we're talking about an MXR overdrive pedal or a Boss overdrive pedal or a Schecter guitar versus a Gibson guitar, there's going to be things that to some people it's going to be worthwhile to own both. But they're all so very similar in the grand scheme of things. You know, if you told me I had to record an album with this pedal and one guitar versus this pedal and another, I could do it. Maybe I prefer one thing about the other one a little bit more, but it is not going to matter in the grand scheme of things. And even, you know, very disparate amplifier heads or very disparate guitars, when viewed through that lens, are really not that different. You can make it work. If I was forced to record with a Pod XT, 
I wouldn't be very happy about it. I'd much rather have a Kemper profile or especially an Axe Effects, but I could do it. There are quality differences, especially to someone who's passionate about this kind of stuff, but amp modeling, overdrives, amplifiers, it's all a dime a dozen these days. And to try to you know own is something as abstract as you know the electric guitar, because that's essentially what Gibson's trying to do here, uh, at least when it falls in a, a certain shape and um, tries to appeal to a certain crowd, it's just unbelievably arrogant at, at best. So my mantra has always been and will continue to be, if an entity can look at a competitor's product and make something that is equitable, something that is competitive, more valuable, less cost, same feature set if not better, more desirable, then why shouldn't they be allowed to? I say go for it. And you know, things get complicated when you're talking about intellectual property, copyrights, all that kind of stuff. But at some point you gotta say, if you can just look at something from a distance without breaking out a ruler, <laughs> a you know a square anything and you can copy it from memory how original is it uh you know i, I totally get stuff like i don't want coca-cola's brand on something that isn't coke that'd be misleading that's obviously why those kind of things exist but for something as simple as an electric guitar shape or something as simple as the look of an amplifier head or the general layout of an overdrive pedal no one person should be able to own that. It's just absolutely ridiculous. In the same way that no single company should be allowed to own the concept of a drinking glass or a plate or a fork because it is beyond generic at this point. In the same way that I think a lot of guitar body shapes are beyond generic. Even a lot of the ergonomic stuff is so proliferated. You can't even tell where one brand ends and one begins just from looking here down. And you know, that's, that's the state of the world we live in. And so, that's why I make the argument that, you know, all this stuff, it's important to note, it's important to understand the differences and get the best product that suits you. But that's why people like me are here. That's why you look at user reviews, you look at aggregated scores, you look at all these things to figure out which of these same basic products are for me. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about overdrive pedals or six string guitars, you're probably going to get something that works for you. E even if you just spin a wheel and <laughs> pick it blindly, they're all pretty damn similar if you're looking within certain price ranges, if you're looking at you know certain configurations. So I'll be really interested to see where this whole lawsuit thing goes. I obviously hope they don't win because there's just no way to rationalize it. Um, again, if they have the, the strong arm of their legal force, then anything is possible. But if, if they do succeed, then there's going to be a lot of guitar brands that are probably going to be in for a rude awakening. And I just hope that doesn't happen because as I've hopefully made the case here, for them to imply ownership of anything at this point that didn't you know, come out and was immediately patented is just laughable based on their, uh, their, their track record. So yeah, let me know what you think of this ridiculous situation in the comment below. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next time with something a bit more productive than me ranting again. Thanks for watching, bye.